hello everyone, my name is Duncan Bruce. I'm the alumni manager at the National Film and Television School. And this is gonna be a series of webinars that we'll be providing free for everyone to see. And the first one is obviously talking about how we bring LGBT stories to the screen. And we're thrilled to have Russell T Davis, who's a fantastic writer and creator of Queer as Folk, Cucumber Banana, Years and Years, and obviously It's a Sin most recently. And we've got three alumni who are joining us. All three have worked on a Russell T Davis uh, project. So we have Charles McDougall who directed Queer as Folk and originated that show as the director. Then we've got Paolo Pandolfo who cut, I think, uh, I think he cut seven episodes of Banana and two episodes six, of six Cucumber. Six of Banana and two of Cucumber. Six of Banana, two of Cucumber. Sounds like a great recipe. Uh, and we've got David Katz Nelson, who is a cinematography graduate, and he shot It's a Sin. Um, just so you know, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a, a Q&A section. Feel free to ask questions throughout, and I'll try and get as many of them answered as you guys ask. Um, we're going to start with Queer as Folk. Uh, I'm going to avoid doing the whole why, where were you born, how did you get about, because let's get into the nitty gritty, let's talk about the shows themselves. Uh, Queer as Folk aired in 1999. Uh, I was always amazed by Queer as Folk because it aired at a time when Section 28 was still in place. The age of consent was still 18 for LGBT people. And this was an incredibly bold and in some respect dangerous show to air for Channel 4. Uh, and so I was just curious if we could start with where the queerest folk originated in terms of the actual idea, Russell. Uh, right. Well, it was, I mean, it's pure Channel 4, really. It's, it's what Channel 4 is there to do. It's what Channel 4 was created for. It's why Channel 4 has a license to make stuff that's different and to provide, provide voice for others. And there was kind of a feeling there that, um, oh, I don't want to criticise anyone. There was, there was slightly a feeling there that the channel had drifted away from that message slightly. Then Gub Neal and Katrina McKenzie came along. Um, Katrina McKenzie is actually one of the important people in my life because she was the she kind of spotted my gay scripts that I was doing on soap operas and things and said come to Channel 4 and write this and many many years ago in 1995 I was in a meeting at Granada with her where I was talking about my friend Jill who, who, who was spending her life on the AIDS wards uh, visiting people who were dying and in 1995 Katrina McKenzie sat there and went that sounds like a good drama so she's literally, she's, 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 the whole of my life, she's there. And I haven't seen her for like the 20 years in between, but um, she's, she's a brilliant woman. So they were there. They wanted to kick Channel 4 drum up the arse. That's a, a project like Queer as Folk was, was designed for that. So in many ways, you know, you must get this, Charles. People often go, ooh, how did you get that on air? But it was exactly what they wanted on air. It was the opposite. It was like, they, they were like, please, please come and do this. I mean, it wasn't that easy as ever, but... Um, it was, and you're right in describing the world. That was a world with Section 28 was still in place. So, you know, no gay schoolboy could ever voice, or gay or schoolgirl or queer kid could ever voice their identity or their thoughts, which made me therefore kind of want to write a 15 year old. And not just as a political act, but I was just starting to see kids of that age appear in, in clubs, in nightclubs. That was like the next generation on their way. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. But yeah, Section 28 was there. The, the age of consent was different. So, there's a fair bit of anger there. Um, but I, I'm not sure it was written in anger particularly. I think it was mostly because I'd been living in Manchester since 1987 and I was going out to Canal Street. If anything, it was the best research I ever did because it was like 10 years of going clubbing on that street and watching everything. And I used to love going clubbing on my own. If I bumped into people when I was out in a nightclub, I'd, go, I'd say hello and then get them to leave me alone because I love standing on the rail of that dance floor watching <laughs> everyone just in the smoke with the smoke. That the clubs were full of smoke in those days, cigarette smoke and not just smoke machines and just the heat and the light to the dance floor. And you'd watch people like you just I just stand there watching people thinking, you're a bank clerk all week long. You just sit in the bank and do your job. And maybe you live at home and you're not out to your parents. And then you come out here and you go mad on the dance floor till two in the morning, in the days when places shut in two in the morning. And I used to love it. It was all those years of watching it that kind of led to it. I don't know how you feel, Charles, about it, where you came in. Well, yeah, people call it provocative, but I just thought it was a very fresh script and, and the first four scripts were very refreshing and very truthful. And that's what I'm always looking for, especially something I haven't done before. 
but secondly, something that is absolutely truthful. It doesn't matter what your sexuality is. It's about friendship, so love, and everything in it was truthful in the way that television drama normally isn't because it wasn't trying to show these people always being good to each other. They behaved appallingly sometimes, and that's part of the fun of it. And the other thing was fantastic was that the tone of it shifted on a dime, which shifted from being funny to being sexy to being full of grief, for example, in the, in the funeral um, episode on four, I think it was. So it was just something that was remarkably fresh writing that required very little work in the script sense once I got on board. And then I had to do a lot of research and your research that you did over 10 years, I did in probably 10 weeks in pre-production going out every Thursday, Friday and Saturday to the gay clubs in Manchester in my suit, standing in the middle of the floor when suddenly the phone would arrive and I'd be up to here in, in phone. But learning a lot, obviously seeing a lot, trying to put some of that into the background action and uh, just loving the whole um, world that I didn't know anything about when I started. And I've done that on several films now that I've not known anything about the subject matter, such as Bloody Sunday going to um, Derry and being English in Derry is, is a very odd experience when you're trying to learn about that kind of thing. But I, I, I just 100% go into a story like that went into um, this world and it was just absolutely fantastic. It was a wonderful process experience. And, you know, it's very interesting as, as you talked about recently with, with heterosexual actors, because they either had to balk at it or throw themselves wholeheartedly into it, and these three did. Yes. And so it was very, um, very it, was a, it was a wonderful um, experience on, on all counts for me. There were script notes, Charles. You forget, it's like the fourth episode was written, very he- rewritten very heavily because Charles gave the best script notes ever. Well, he didn't give them to me. You give your script notes to Nicola. And I'm, very good at I'm very good at reading upside down on a desk. And the <laughs> script notes, literally, your script notes went, episode one, very good. Episode two, good. Episode three, excellent. <laughs> episode four, rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Why was that? And that was that at the very beginning, at the very beginning. And the original episode four was rubbish. You were right. Oh. And Nicola was kind of like sitting there going, I think perhaps we could look at possibly <laughs> revisiting episode four. And I was really upset. I went, it's rubbish, isn't it? <laughs> and, uh, and it was, do you remember in the original episode four, they stayed for the whole episode of the funeral. They never went home. They didn't, it, eventually I, the funeral was half the episode. And, and then they went off and, 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 and lived their lives. So it was like, it was a great, it was a good rewrite. It was the best note I've ever had, rubbish. <laughs> it was brilliant. So. Good I do that in America. It doesn't go down so well. <laughs> <laughs> it was excellent. Thank you for that note. And so, yeah, and I talk about casting. It's like, I'm sorry, Duncan, but it's yeah. like, you know, those, you know, we can discuss forever whether you cast gay or cast straight, but those boys were brave. They were people turning us down, weren't they? I Both they heterosexual and gay actors. And, and it, they were terrified, weren't they? It would yeah. be someone was booked the night before and the next day their agent would call. Yes. We'd, we'd send an offer out and then their agent would call the next day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've forgotten that. Yeah, it was, and those three were really brave, especially with Charlie. Bless him, he was nineteen years old. It's like we owe everything to them. You see yeah. that whatever gets mentioned now, those three get pushed down. I still say about straight actors, even today, straight actors playing games. If they walk in the wrong pub on the wrong night, they can be in trouble. You know, yeah. you're that gay pub off the telly. So it's like, well done, them. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I remember that there was some opposition to Charlie because I I saw something in him that. Uh, was magical actually he wasn't a great actor at that stage he was very raw you know he'd done biker was it sorry biker grove was it yeah what what he done sorry yeah and uh, he'd been a waiter for a long time having an italian restaurant but been asked to be in a boy band you know which would have been easy for him to do and he came in but there's something magical about his smile to me and i just thought if we could capture that on screen it it's a great start I can remember him walking through the door. That's the most beautiful man you've ever seen in your life. Like, amazing. I can remember yeah. him, please be able to act, please be able to act. <laughs> <laughs> As he sat down, he went, yeah. And do you remember, he came into his audition, and you said, who's your favourite actor? And, and, and he said, I've forgotten his name. Um, Christopher Walken. He said, Christopher Walken, which is such an interesting choice for a young man mm-hmm. to give. He just went, oh, you're... It immediately made me think, well, you're quite serious about your craft, you know? Like, I wow. think that's what's admirable about him, because since then, when he got a lot of heat after the show, he didn't do the teen movies that he was being offered in the States. He didn't do all the magazines that he was being offered. He just wanted to be a good actor. And, it, you know, he's proved it. And I'm, I'm so delighted to see him working with A-list directors and actors and holding his metal. You know, it's it's really a fantastic story, I think. Oh, it's lovely. And he's always so proud of Queer Smoke. He never complains about it being referenced and he still talks about it happily and that's like you don't need to do that that's like the end of the mile that's so good of him 
well brought up land. So well, Go ahead. Did, did Aidan, Craig and Charlie have any reservations about taking any of the roles in the show or were they all completely comfortable with going for it? Because I, I believe none of them are gay. So it was in some respect a new world to them and they were going to be obviously leads in a very LGBT oriented show. So I was just wondering if they had any reservations that you guys can remember or was there any concern? I, I can talk about first meeting Aiden. I went to see Mojo in Lower Regent Street Cinema and walked down from there to Channel 4 across St James's Park to meet Aiden. We were both early and we waited in Michael Jackson's office. <laughs> uh, for, were you coming, at Russell, or was it Nicola? I can't remember. I don't think I was there for that, no. Um... Well, we, were, we, we were waiting for someone, but we, we sat in this office the two of us, both very shy, not talking for 20 minutes. And then we, we thought we'd better start this meeting. So we started the meeting at the end of which, you know, we talked about the script and he, he obviously responded to it greatly. The end of which I said, you know, there will be these scenes of sex and we have to choreograph them and they're going to be um, more um, openly sexual than a lot of things that have been on television. And his reply, which I remember today was great, when do we start? <laughs> and, and that's what you need, you know, there's no embarrassment no embarrassment from Charlie, you know, it was those two in particular who were um, performing the sex scenes. And so long as I think you're very honest and direct about what you want, and they're very honest and direct about what they do want to do or don't want to do, um, I think you, it's very straightforward. And they were both absolutely fantastic. So, I mean, obviously, is a, in terms of filming and any inspirations, was there any kind of reference you had for what you thought Queer Film might look like? I mean, it was very groundbreaking television show. I was just curious if there was anything that you discussed in terms of look, color palette, because obviously you have those vignettes where the actors are talking to camera and it's kind of almost a bit Woody Allen, Annie Hall-esque in the fact that the characters are kind of narrating their lives to this person. And I was just wondering if there was any references or any anything that you imagined that was uh, an inspiration. Awesome. Well, it's fairness to bring in Nicola here, Nicola Schindler, the producer who brought us all together. And she was always, and still is always, hugely admiring of American television. Back then, British television didn't look so beautiful, actually. And I think, Charles, it's, I've got to say how much uh, uh, massive influence you had on the DOP, but a great DOP, but you were lighting it, Charles. You were amazing up there and, and making it, bringing Canal Street to life. And, and that's, you know, Nicola used to talk about Ali McBeal, you know, the show might be rubbish, but it looks beautiful. And I always, just, I always used to agree with that because you think back then, back then in 1998, if you were channel hopping through all the channels, well, there were less channels then, but if you were channel hopping, you'd stop at Ali McBeal because it was so beautifully shot. Even if the plot was rubbish and she was moaning about not having a baby, then nonetheless, you look at the streets here, there's exteriors now, you go, wow, that looks absolutely gorgeous. So we were all kind of, you know, costume, everyone kind of pushing for a beauty to it. Not, not a false glamour, I don't think it ever looks false, but it's genuinely drenched in colour, the lenses are fantastic. I mean, over to you, Charles, really, you know that better than well, me. Yeah, we wanted to make it sexy, uh, fast moving, so the camera's always in movement through the clubs and such like, and the colour schemes were always much more vibrant than the own reality, because if you go there on a wet Wednesday when it's raining on Canal Street, it's not quite, well, at that time, it wasn't quite as vibrant as that. So we were using um, projectors on the walls of buildings and things like that. But that was a combination of uh, design with Claire Kenny, Nigel Walters, the DP, and ourselves just trying to make a world that was sexy to to feel you want to be a part of in, inviting and uh, you know i hope that was part of its success mm. it's I, how did the change? I think awesome. british television is quite that's quite normal now but you were you were absolutely ahead of the game in making right. that right and then we had this wonderful um warehouse where we made stuart's apartment uh incredible design by claire in which we had this thirty thousand pound sofa a snap machine, all these various wonderful pieces of warehouse living. One one Sunday, I went along to um, design the shots for the following week's scenes there in the afternoon. I got checked in and etc. went up, did my work. A couple of hours later, came down. I got a call from the police the following day. All the furniture had been stolen. I don't know if you remember. Yes, oh my <laughs> they God. Cleaned, they cleaned us out. <laughs> these, these incredibly expensive rentals. So uh, somehow we had to um, put it all together again. But, but you know, yeah, the idea of that space that Stuart had was unprecedented wasn't it the size of that building yes. and yeah and, and that's you yeah, a lot of directors would have gone just gone for a smaller space and it's vast and it became famous for it didn't it, it became it's it's for one of the better words iconic it is really it's an amazing claire is such a brilliant designer she's mm. absolutely fantastic 
So when let's fast forward, you you provide the the final. Eight, I think it's eight episodes to Channel Four. Was there any concern? Was there any kind of concern raised about the final content, or were they happy to just go to air? There was a lot of niggling about the sex, wasn't there? Just because there was, was trim, very small trims, wasn't it? Yeah, but I felt it's like at one point it went to some man we'd never heard of. It was like the Lord of Channel Four. You know, you work with the drama department, and then yeah. it kind of goes to the the head of the channel, and then this. Like the clouds parted, some supremo who's never been heard of before since <laughs> appeared with his and 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 what Charles was saying was that they it just came down to trims like shortening the sex scenes, which actually made them more powerful. What they didn't realize was that kind of leapt out of the scene and it all became a bit faster and a bit more stark. So we quietly said, They go, Oh, that's even better, actually. <laughs> and I didn't tell them that if we just handed it back, and went, there we are, there's your cuts. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, and Nico. the other thing that was a great. Uh, improvement was after one um, session with one composer who produced a very elegant, serious score. We went to Murray Gold and then it became playful. Yeah. And that was absolutely in keeping with the style of the writing, wasn't it? Yeah, that brought it to life. It was good old Murray. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. did you have any anticipation of what you had and how big an impact it was going to make on television when you... Mm. were making it or when you were about to show it i wondered did you i, I kind of they it was a it was commissioned as a 10 o'clock drama and then as we headed towards transmission they shifted it to 10 30 and i kind of thought it was dead then i kind of thought right that, i mean a 10 30 drama that's a graveyard slot so i really thought this will just be niche and small and tiny and then, then we ended up with a gold disc. That's my favourite successful thing ever. We've got a gold disc. I've got it in this house somewhere. Like, <laughs> <laughs> the soundtrack went mad. So no, I wasn't expecting it. I mean, I think I kind of thought we'll have a fuss about the sex, um, but that's you know that doesn't matter. Um, did you, Charles? What did you think? Were you expecting? I, uh, well, I, I just go with my instincts every time, and I go with the script that makes me interested enough to want to do it for the next how many uh, months. I knew it was good writing, and you know, you have to mess it up in order for it not to remain good writing. And so, in, you know, I was fairly confident that it was still fresh by the time we got to the end of the process of making it. But you, don't, you never know what level of promotion is going to be given. And it really was full on promotion, wasn't it? It was massive posters. Remember those posters everywhere? Yeah. 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 If Fed was the channel, they completely backed it. Yeah. 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 I must admit, uh, as a 16 year old who was still not, had not come out and was still, you know, not sure who they were inside. Uh, like many people, we only had one television in the house, so you had to persuade the family to watch whatever was the group activity. And I wanted everyone to watch Queer as Folk. And I tried to persuade everyone it's a water cooler event and you had to watch it and it was going to be what everyone talked about. So I remember sitting on the sofa with my dad, <laughs> watching the first episode of Queer as Folk, and obviously you get to the scene where there is rimming, and I remember turning to my dad and just seeing his mouth truly open in complete shock. But me also smiling and knowing inside that this was the world that I wanted to explore and get into. And I was curious whether you still get stories from gay people today about how much that show impacted their lives in terms of it making it mainstream and making it okay to be gay and seeing it on TV and being able to relate to a character and relate to a world? Well, I do, to be honest. It's, I, to be, I very regularly get men walking up to me in the street and telling me they've masturbated to my work, which is fine. <laughs> it's like, I don't think they mean chuckle vision when they're saying that. <laughs> like, they do, they say to my face. I'm like, you know, it's on a Tuesday afternoon. What do I say to that? Thank you very much. Unless they're very good looking, then I run after them down the street. <laughs> it's like, no, it's, 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 I mean, kind of, yes. Kind of recently, it's kind of as it hits kind of 20 years, actually. Yeah, I do get that. And it's just a great honor and a compliment. I always say that any gay content on television, any queer content on television, triggers someone somewhere because it's the minority. It's still the minority and it's still lacking. And there's always some 
lonely heart watching the television, some repressed son or some wife who's never expressed herself, or some, some daughter who's got a secret life online that's dying for that material. So it's, you know, you see, if a gay advert airs, you, you, see, you get people saying, oh my God, that advert meant so much to me. And you know, two people kissed in that advert, and that's amazing. And that's really, it's, it's, it's the mind it goes into, not the mouth it comes out of, if you see what I mean. Um, that sounded dirtier than I meant it to. But um, it's, 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 but nonetheless, people, do you, do you get that, Charles? Do you still get that? Yeah. In the states, because it went round on VHSs, round all the studios and offices and stuff, you know. So a lot of people of young age then are in positions of uh, employment now. Um, but you were very deliberate in making him fifteen, weren't you? For that reason, that people without a voice or people who were just starting to come out or think about it, how the hell they could come out would yeah. have some character to identify with. Yes, because that that I mean, you know, we were not the first gay characters on the screen, but. There were not many characters like that. Or to be 15, you had no voice. You had no voice in society. Actually, you don't anyway, still. It's at 15 years old, you're powerless and 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 burning at home. There was someone, there's a family around the corner from me. And I used to walk past and you'd always see the son, for some reason, the son of the front bedroom, normally the parents of the, the front bedroom. And in this family, the son of the front bedroom. And he'd always be dancing to himself all like that. And he'd have headphones on and he'd be kind of happy and furious at the same time. And, and dancing just completely in the world of his own. I used to, I just used to walk past that bedroom thinking that's a story, that, 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 that trapped life at home. I hope he was happy in the end. I don't know what happened to him, but um, yeah. It's a good story. It's always a good story, that. Always. Still. I, I, I just um, remember it's being uncompromising throughout. And for people who are watching, I think it's really important to stay uncompromising. Mm. You know, you get whittled away as you go through the production process, don't you? Particularly in my world in America. And it's just, you just have to become awkward at times. I don't know whether you have that now, Russell, or it just floats through now. But, but I kind of I kind of have it lucky now because of Queer as Folk and because I'm still in Britain. So if I'm walking through the door, then you're going to get gay content, whether you like it or not. And yeah. and I'll never know what doors are not open to me. But that's that's kind of an easy thing to say because I think most commissioners here are very friendly towards new voices, new content. They want to push stories further and do new stuff. I think it's always it's funny though. I've just um, I've just seen. I know it's tough in America. I've just seen there's a new HBO show called Generation which is um, coming out in March, HBO Max. And um, I just did a Zoom thing with them because um, I'm talking about It's a Sin, they're talking about that. And they've got scenes like on a mobile phone with a photo of an erection. Um, you know, like people send dick pics and stuff like that. And I was going, that would never be allowed in Britain. I actually said, if that, if you sell your show to Britain, how on earth are you going to cope with that scene? Because you're not allowed to show that. So it's it's kind of a sign that, that I was delighted to see it, might I say. So it's kind of a sign that, you know, that's with progress slowly, I suppose. I suppose that's HBO as opposed to networks, but yeah. So how did Queer as Folk impact your careers, both of you, Russell and Charles, after its release? Oh God, I wouldn't be here without it, really. It's like everything still talked about and still... I still rely on it really. Um, I'm, I, I hope, kind of hope it's the show on my tombstone in a way, which will be in about 60 years time is the plan. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I love it. I owe so much to it. Charles? Um, likewise. And uh, I just really enjoyed it. I mean, I, I have nothing but good memories of it. And it got me work in the States. I went to do, uh, I think Sex and City it was the second job I did in the States directly because of this, uh, Darren Starr obviously had seen this and uh, I did that for a number of years with other shows, but um, you know, I, don't, I didn't want to keep doing the same show again and again, so I've always um, tried to cross genres, I suppose, but um, it, it was a, a great help in the States because it was seen illicitly and uh, by people who were in positions that were making shows, you know. It's lovely, let's be honest, it's lovely to have worked on a show when people recognise the title. Because normally you spend your life sitting in the back of a taxi going, that show, it's on ITV, with that man, it was on last week, no, never heard of it, no, that one thing, it's like, that's, what it's like. that's normally. So when you can say Queer as Folk, or Doctor Who's the best one, everyone in the world has heard of Doctor Who. <laughs> the old nod, oh right, yeah. So Queer as Folk was remade in the US, did you have- Charles a Vanish then, did Charles Vanish? That's it, that's the end of his segment, he's nicked off. We have to pay per, you know, minute. I mentioned Charles, Charles is huge, such big. No, I'm sure he's going to put back. Um, do, do you, would you involved in any way in the US remake of Queer as Folk? Oh, nicely and politely. They were lovely. They were lovely to me. But actually, I didn't want to. I mean, I could 
we are being recorded. I can tell you all sorts of stories, but I'll go with the official version. But the, the actual production team were lovely and the, and the writers, Ron and Dan, were very lovely. But we didn't want to look over their shoulders. I mean, what I mean is contractually behind the scenes, there were all sorts of mad shenanigans went on and court cases. But um, we didn't want to look over their shoulders. And make it. They didn't want us looking over. I think we gave notes on the first script and then you're like 6,000 miles away. Well, what's the point of doing that? And then they were very nice. They flew me over for the launch. I was very excited because Helen Mirren was at the launch. That was like, wow, that was so spectacular. But that was all really. And then it ran for five years. I think it's very noticeable. By the way, if you, if you read any article about British shows traveling across to America, it's never mentioned. It was very successful and it ran for five years, but gay programs are still seen as niche. They're still seen as different. They're still seen as not, you know, if there's an article about gay television, then it'll be talked about. If you're talking about shows transferring, and that article crops up every few years in The Guardian or The Times or something, British shows that have made it big over there. It's never mentioned, he said bitterly and angrily. <laughs> it's terrible. Whereas Hogwarts, the American one, was the first uh, gay thing that I've seen on TV, you know. Uh, was it? So I watched that before I watched the original version. Oh, right. But that, that was on, I think it was called Cinemax in, in Brazil was when I was growing up. And, you know, they used to show it on Friday night at like 12 or something. <laughs> and I used to watch it as a teenager, uh, you know. Yeah. And I, that was absolutely so incredible. And then discovered the British version. I was hugely uh, proud of it. I, remember I went to America once. I was in Florida. And there you were literally flicking through 500 channels. And on one channel, there was two men kissing. And it was the American Queers Folk. I was like, yeah. yes, hooray. I'm glad it's there. No, don't say that about Charles. Don't say that about him. He's back. Shh, don't be rude. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna zoom ahead sixteen years, uh, and we're gonna arrive at cucumber banana tofu. Um, so the world is completely different, and still not, if that makes sense, because we have equal marriage. Section twenty eight has been repealed. But there's still some equality and there's still, you know, campaigns and fights that the LGBT community have to fight. And I was curious, how did you begin, Russell, in setting this new story in this new world and avoid it being uh, going over the territory of queer as folk and actually making it current to 2015 and, and showing that 16 year difference? Well, that's that's exactly it. That's what I set out to do, and um, and it's a much more middle aged drama, and um, which is less appealing. And we have to be honest; it absolutely died a death on it. <laughs> no one watched this one, <laughs> but I love it. I'm very proud of the show, and uh, blimey, it disappeared. And um, but that's yeah, that that came from many years of me thinking about being a gay man where we are now. I was very much aware of having written something about that in 1999, and. Um, that was the point, actually. And things like gay marriage had come along. And, you know, the, the first episode of Cooper is a couple who've been very happily together for 10 years or something until gay marriage comes along. So some, one, suddenly one of them can say, I would, do you want to marry me? And um, the other one's like, no, no, that's what happened to me. I was like, I never wanted to get married. And eventually I was tricked into marrying my husband again because he was dying. That's a really low blow that he ran past me. It's like, literally, we've got to do this now. Like, All right, then. But um, before that, he'd asked me to marry. And I was like, no, no way. Just because I don't know why anyone gets married. Why does anyone get married? What a mad thing to do. It's just nuts. And so I thought that was fascinating that suddenly gay men could marry and gay women. And, and, and the option, how that suddenly threw relationships. That was the starting point. And the, how that threw then you start questioning your whole life. Who am I? Why don't I want to marry? Who, what, are, what am I in the world? And so it kicked that into motion. So that was the starting point, was the changes in the world made uh, me write that, yeah. I read it was in development since 2006. Would that be true or? Yeah, that's good. I mean, my life got interrupted by Doctor Who for like about 10 years. Um, no, not 10 years, but eight years. So um, yes, it's funny now with It's a Sin, everyone's like going, why now? Why have you written this now? And I'm just sitting there going, it would have been eight years earlier if Doctor Who hadn't got in the way. So, um, you know, there's never any, don't believe anyone when they say why now. You're just waiting for a commission to say yes. That's why now. Someone said yes. Um, but yeah, I'd been, I'd been thinking about it for a long time. Yeah. And at the same time, Banana was, um, and it was very good of Channel 4 to commission such a great big raft of shows at the same time, because I was kind of aware that here I come with the old gay men perspective. And so there was, it had a sort of companion series that would be, New voices, lesbian stories, trans stories, just queer stories, really, just and, and younger writers, people getting their first, some people getting their first scripts on screen, some 
uh, some brand yeah, some brand new stuff, brand new directors, um, 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 and and some, some terrible new editors, obviously, Paolo. Terrible. Terrible. Both, both of us, me and Johnny, were it, it was our first thing, you know, and uh, cutting. It was our first, our first. Was it your first broadcast thing? You mean it was? Yeah, wasn't it? Wow. yeah, it was. Wow, I forget that. I mean, I knew it at the time, and you're just brilliant. So you know, we got Lewis Arnold on board to direct uh, some episodes of Banana. He was just fresh out of the. Well, he'd done Misfits, and he'd done a bit of Tally. Yeah, he'd done Misfits. Out of the National Films, and he brought you to us, Paolo, which was yeah, glorious. Uh, yeah, for me it was incredible. I just couldn't believe it. Yeah, I, uh, but I knew I needed to do it. I knew I needed to do that show when I when I when Lewis got it. We'd been with I tried. He tried to bring me al along with him for uh, for Misfits, and that didn't work because you know two guys out of fresh out of film school, they you know they, that didn't work. But when Banana, uh, he told me about it, and I read the first episode. I said I need to. I need to get this show. I need to make this show because I knew, I knew that I understood it, and I knew that I I just could see it. I love the style of it. I love everything about it. But I didn't know that I would end up cutting six episodes and then cucumber as well. I mean, that you know, it just turned into something much bigger than what I originally kind of thought it would be for me. But it was amazing. I've got to say, I've got to say, Charles David. Now you try and book Paolo, and he's like, "No, I'm doing the Crown. I'm sorry, I'm on the Crown. No, 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 come possibly." <laughs> we beg to work with him. Beg like, no, 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 no. No, this is not true. This one I desperately wanted to do. I desperately wanted to do. And I, yeah. It's true. It's quite a successful little show. I'll give you that, Paolo. <laughs> if you want to watch a bunch of people being royalty. <laughs> um, I love it. So cucumber, banana, and tofu. There's three little, three little groups. Uh, each with a different broadcast. I think it was Channel 4, E4, and then it was 4 Online for Tofu. Yes. Yeah. Was that deliberate? Did you, were, were you aiming for different age groups or different specific communities and different stories? Or how did you want that three strand to work? It was, yes. It was It was meant to be uh, Cucuba as mainstream and as big as it could possibly be. Uh, banana for more queer voices, more niche, but it shouldn't be niche, but more alternative. And um, and all and tofu as, as just a different voice, a documentary voice covering. I was kind of aware that um, it's that it's where we are now. That authenticity, that drive for authenticity and truth, and tofu allowed us. I mean, I think I think I love to, and that's made by uh, Benjamin Cook, who'd never uh, made a a, broad, a broadcast documentary before, and he wrote he, he done brilliant stuff on YouTube. So he came and did that for us, and there's brilliant stuff in tofu. There's really underrated stuff in tofu. There's an interview with a. A uh, woman, uh, uh, Lexi, who was a trans, it was asexual. There's an asexual interview in it. And it's the only space I've still ever seen asexuality discussed. And, um, you know, I bring all my prejudices and doubts about asexuality to the table and she knocks them all for six. It's a great piece of work that, you know, you sit there thinking, is this real? Is there something wrong with you? Are you scared? Are you a coward? Are you lying? And to see her demolishing all of these in the interview and properly making an assertive stand for asexuality was that, that would be a radical bit of television now. And, and that was 2015 that went out. So I love, I love to, I'm very proud of the whole thing. I've got to say it didn't work. It's like, because um, I remember before trans, because the, the notion of switching between three different channels, before transmission, a lot of journalists and, and friends actually kind of lined up to say, that's complicated. And we'd sit there, me and Nicola would say, well, it's not complicated. One of them finishes, you can watch the other, or you can watch them all catch up. But actually it was complicated. If people did find that. Here I am taking a long time to describe it. Anything you take a long time to describe is going to be tricky. It's a hard sell. And I kind of realized that, that, um, that I kind of stepped off Doctor Who carousel, which was such a successful program, it was demanding spin-off after spin-off after spin-off, which is great. And I answered that need. I loved doing that. I built an empire there. And what I realized was I came off that in spin-off mood. And with Cucuba, we built the spin-offs before the program was successful. <laughs> That's not a wise move. Little bit of a mistake there. Um, so every, the whole pack carousel was kind of, to, to stretch my analogy, was, was going, was rocking like crazy. It was a horses flying all over the place. Um, but I'm still, I say this, I'm immensely proud of these programs. I'm delighted now that with it's sin that's driving a lot of viewers back to these shows. And apparently the viewing figures are finally going up because it's a great cast. It's a great, great cast across all of them. So yes, it was designed as your great big wide platform niche hitting everyone 
multimedia extravaganza and i realize now you have to grow those things rather than arrive with those things you know uh i was i was reading one critic who said that they thought that banana was less dangerous than queer as folk yeah. and i was wondering whether you thought that was because of the way you'd written it or because actually 15 years later lgbt stories were on the screen and so there was that lack of Maybe. Cucumber, you think cucumber was less dangerous. Cucumber and banana were less dangerous than queer. I completely disagree. In my heart, actually, I think what Cucumber is saying about gay men in the 21st century is much tougher to swallow. Mm. I think it's very, I think part of the reason why it's unpopular, it's, it's, it's very critical of gay men, very, and is unearthing a lot. Actually, if you follow it, it's a drama that makes sense in the very last line. On the last line, it yeah, makes sense. Like as to what's going on. The last line, I mean, that's cheeky. And the last line of eight hours, you go, oh, right, get it. And if you, everything dominoes backwards, you see the entire drama in a different light because it's actually about gay shame and gay fear, which is never going to be a popular thing. Imagine if I sat in a commissioning meeting saying, this is about gay shame. It's kind of no wonder I buried that because that is actually what it's about. That's not a popular subject. What it has to say is tough. And um, I kind of hope that people will pipe up and say, oh, yes, that's me. I'm like that. Yes, I know people like that. And they didn't, but they do exist. It's like what Henry says about sex and sexuality is, is and his own physicality, without going into detail on a six o'clock Zoom here, but um, is very widespread, is very much talked about amongst gay men in private, in secret conversations, in drunk conversations late at night, and still doesn't have a light shone on it. It's not, it's something people are not willing to talk about, but it absolutely exists. Uh, so I think it's much tougher. It's very easy to, well, you know, just because there's no naked ass being eaten, it's not as strong. It's much stronger than that. It's powerful stuff. Yeah, I love it. Very proud of it. So there. <laughs> uh, and Paolo, so you you came uh, you came onto the show uh, via Lewis Arnold, I think, who who was yeah. directing Banana. What were some of the challenges, if there were any, with the kind of structure of the show and the interweaving storylines, especially with Cucumber and Banana airing on two different time slots, two different show, uh, two different channels. Well, there, there weren't really, I mean, it was kind of, it was fun. There weren't, I don't think, challenges. Uh, I mean, I, I would read every every script of Cucumber as well and all the, all the banana ones. But I think Russo and Nicola, you know, they were very, we wanted to play a game where the scenes, even if you had experienced them in one show, were going to be shot, reshot, and kind of, and, and, and showed differently on the other show. So that gave us a lot of freedom to go. You know, I didn't have to cut it in the same way if a scene had been featured in Cucumber and vice versa. But so they were reinterpretations because it was all about perspective. You know, you would experience a scene in Cucumber through Henry's point of view. And then on Banana, you would be through a different whatever that character of the week was. Uh, so I don't think it was a challenging in that. It wasn't challenging in that sense, but it was really fun. I was I loved Cucumber uh, as a even though I wasn't doing it, I wasn't making it at first. I loved reading all the episodes and kind of see how they tied into what, you know, what we were doing on Banana. Um, and yeah, it was, it, it was just a really fun experience. And then when I, when I was able to go into Cucumber, I thought that I kind of understood the world so well after doing six episodes. I, I really felt like I understood how those characters connected and, and, and this style, like, you know, the, uh, the type of world that they lived in and, 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 the type of humor and the type of, of, but I think cucumber is actually, cucumber is much more poignant than banana as a, as a, as general, I think. Dark, it's, much darker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. much darker. Right? And, and, and it plays with the sadness and the, and the humor in, uh, in, in a way that I think It's a Sin does really, uh, 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 it reminds me a lot of that, you know, it really plays with the emotion of being hilarious and being absolutely devastating, much more than, than banana did, I think. Uh, but I felt like I understood the the universe that we were playing in really well after doing so many episodes, you know. Yeah, the nice thing about it was it was like with three shows running on, it was like a campus, you know. It's like as the stars would also go and be interviewed for Tofu and they'd be crossing between two shows. And it was great. And that's just what, again, is great about Nicola and Red Productions. Yeah. Is that um, you'd start work with Paolo. We'd say, you're absolutely brilliant. You'd suddenly see this, this kid. You're a kid, Paolo. You'd see this kid whose editing was just like absolutely amazing. And we had this very, very big episode of Cucumber coming up. And it's like, so Nicola, as ever, alters the schedules, alters the, everything got 
chopped up and never got moved around. It's so that you could come to us and, and edit Cucumber episode six, because that is the yeah. that is the big episode of, of Cucumber is episode and, six. And, and I have to say, even after having done so many things, you know, that I have done now, I mean, this is one of the things that people talk to me about is that episode the most. You know? oh, and it's one of the things that I'm most proud of till this day that I've ever done. I think it's just, I just absolutely adore what we do. And you should watch that because I know, you know this is a lot of National Theatre, uh, Film Theatre School students watching this. It's go and watch that episode for the edit. You can see the, the entire, the last two minutes on screen is images, isn't it? It's images. It's yeah. using their, It's almost, and playing with sound as well. It, it's someone dying and seeing their whole life um, flash before them um, in ways you've never experienced before. And it's that's Paolo. It's just Paolo spinning the decks. Yeah. Using was, it, whatever you do in an edit. But, it was um, really yeah. great. It was a really great experience doing, doing that, that episode. It was, yeah. It's because it plays like a standalone thing as well. I absolutely it's so hard, isn't it? It's it's without I mean it's a real it's about to say it's a tough piece of work. It's without hope and it's without mercy, that episode. And that's a yes. real thing to work. Yeah. <laughs> it's brutal. It is really brutal. And yeah, the 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 violence I, I remember it was one of the things that I've caught that I got more upset as I was working on till this day. Uh, you know, when I was cutting that last not only just the death process itself, but the attack. Mm. And, you know, day in, day out watching that and stuff. It was, I remember feeling really kind of shaken in the edit by every day, just kind of working on that. And it still is to this day. When I'll never forget how, how it made me feel having, to, you know, putting that together. I remember watching it. And it's ruthless. It's like there's a man dying. And the very last thing he sees for a second is that woman at work who he hates, who was crying in his office. <laughs> that's, the, that's his final memory. That's tough, isn't it? That's not... Yeah, in there. There's no love. There's no romance. There's no kindness. It's tough. My God, <laughs> me. <Blimey. laughs> it's a great edit. That it's a magnificent edit. No. Um, did you find that um, obviously cucumber banana allows you to show a wider representation of the LGBT community? Um, was that one of the goals you set out to do with that show? Because queer as folk obviously is a bit more focused. Yes, absolutely, and and to give new voices, I'm kind of I'm kind of aware that I almost fill too much space sometimes. You want a gay voice, here I am, and um, and I'm very lucky to get the work that I do. But there are other voices, and so um, that's why we had lesbian writers on there. We had uh, we had younger gay writers as well. Matthew Barry is a different generation to me. Um, just more range, more range, more sexuality, more variations, more more queerness, just more queer the whole thing, and. And it's nice if people haven't seen it, they're half hours. I also like the fact they're half hours. That's a nice, I'm loving the kind of half hour format that's springing into existence now. I've just watched A Teacher. Have you seen A Teacher? I love that. I yeah, that... I really love that as well. Oh, it's great, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. like, honestly, oh, David, have a look at it. It's, it's on the iPlayer now. And it's like, it's kind of like, every, it does lots of scenes that you've seen a million times. Like, I love you. I hate you. I'm having an affair. I'm leaving you. And it does them all differently and really with great insight in ways I've never seen done before. It's really fantastic piece of work. So that half hour format is lovely, I think. More of that, please. Yeah. So after Cucumber Banana, uh, you mentioned in the press that you were beginning to develop a show that focused on the AIDS epidemic, but obviously it would take um, a further 10 years, well, not 10 years, seven years to arrive. Years or something. I had to wait until David Katz Nelson was free. That was the problem. <laughs> 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 Always busy. <laughs> Thank God I, I, I came on board, though. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I was curious. Well, I think every, every writer's got a story like that about shows that take it. I mean, it's, it's a scene that's kind of so madly popular at the moment that the slightest statement about it is gaining too much weight and in one interview I said oh yeah it took a few years to get commissioned and that's become like stories in the press that going BBC refused to make this show and it's completely normal it's completely normal for shows to go from desk to desk it's like yes the BBC turned it down but maybe they spent that money on I May Destroy You maybe they spent that money on small acts they're really allowed to do that it's it's an interesting one it's a sin because I read in one of the criticisms about queer as folk from the gay community was it didn't talk about AIDS. And so I wondered whether that was always something you were aware of back then that you wanted to tell that story and it was going to have to come at some point. 
Um, oh, I suppose. So. I mean, it's like, I mean, Queer's Folk is absolutely about AIDS by never mentioning it. It's 1998. People are still dying. It's like the antiretrovirals, had, uh, uh, that's when I wrote it in 98, the antiretroviral drugs had appeared in like 1996. And everyone, everyone kind of rewrites history as though we, we all relaxed then. We didn't know if they worked. We didn't know if they worked for long. We didn't know what the side effects were. They, they, they weren't, they turned out to be excellent. We didn't know that then. We still lived in every single... It's like the, with vaccines now, people still fear them. And it was definitely like that with enter, anti-retro. So they were comp that illness was completely defining us. So Queer as Folk, frankly, is absolutely brilliant at refusing to let that virus define us or own us or conquer us in any way. It is there, actually. It's like if you listen to the script, it's in... In, in Craig Kelly posted a page of the script last night um, on Instagram. Mm. And even that script mentions a candlelit vigil. What does that mean? That's mm. the language of AIDS. It's always there, isn't it, Charles? It's like yeah, the legal document that do you remember the legal document that Stuart had to sign when the baby was born. That's says, right. If, if you become ill, ill, you know. Yes, and he says, "What do you mean ill?" And it just hangs in the air, doesn't it? I've forgotten. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's an AIDS scene, isn't it? It's always there. Um, it's always there. Its absence is is huge. In 1998, to have mm. done that, that's like so. So I suppose with hindsight, it was maybe I was always set on a path to writing. It's a sin. I don't know. It's that you can't. You, the, when I try to describe this, it sounds as though my life is planned, and it's not. It's all just made up as it goes along. But if you look at Henry's gay shame and gay fear, he does sit down in episode five and talk about the icebergs. That's a very, it's a very clear line uh, in to Henry. And actually, in that episode six that we were just talking about with with Paolo, Lance has. I mean, that's the toughest statement about HIV you could possibly make because Lance isn't HIV positive. His first lover dies. Yeah of AIDS and the whole the reason that whole episode episode says is explaining why Lance all his life compromises and and puts up with second best and doesn't do it. it's because he's been battered since he was young his very first lover died of AIDS and so instead of making him a fighter it's made him a compromiser it's made him a nice man and that tough episode is about the death of a nice man because he's so nice he doesn't save himself he's told all the way through that episode to go home and he doesn't because he's nice because he fancies someone he's got that bloodlust in him I mean I've always said Charles it's like that the death in episode three is 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 in quote of queer as folk is oh, yeah. death after a night of sex yeah. it's kind of it's it's all compressed into that and, which you shot in my house you filmed that in my house you devil move the Dalek out of the way <laughs> exactly it's still there it's in the garden now <laughs> And after they left, after they left, they would re repaint your house. They said, what colour do you want to do? I said, let's go yellow. That was the worst decision of my life. <laughs> I was like living inside a box of Kiora for like 10 years. I got rid of it eventually. <laughs> and, um, but so it is there. It is there. And it's, it, it's, you can see, you know, when, when, when the last line of, of Cucumber gives it all away, that's Henry's shame and his fear. So if you want to draw a line, you would say that was always heading towards it's a sin. And I do remember finishing Cucumber and kind of going, right, it's age next. I actually said it like that. I said it to Channel 4. I said when Piers Wenger was uh, head of drama there, I literally went, we had some sort of press meeting where I just went, right, that's it. It has to be AIDS next. So it kind of rose up. It, it, it would be a false story if I said, I was always dying to write this. Um, life is much more made up than that, and much less planned, but it rose up. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, so it, it's a sin, it's... <laughs> I mean, we could say it's probably the most talked about television show of the moment. I mean, it's, it's huge. I mean, as Lewis Arnold told me via text, it's the best thing since Chernobyl. It's it's the thing everyone's talking about, everyone wants to see, everyone wants to discuss. And so I wondered how you felt about the fact that you had Queer as Folk, which was kind of groundbreaking television, Cucumber Banana, which was it struggled to find an audience at first and now it is finding an audience and then you have it's a sin 20 years after queer as folk which is mind-blowingly finding an audience without any problems at all is that a realization that lgbt stories are now mainstream that people want to watch them that there aren't the kind of internal concerns that people may have had 20 years ago with queer as folk i think that's partly true i could be cynical about that it's put beautiful young boys in something and it's more popular. The unpopular one <laughs> didn't do that. But- um, Well, Freddie, Freddie Fox was in uh, Cucumber Banana and- Yes, beautiful. Playing a very hard character, a very yeah. hard and unapproachable character. It's like, yes, um, it's it's an interesting world, isn't it? It's it, it's funny for me to have them all in my head as a 
they're written in the wrong order. You know, it's I should have written it's. A, I think you can take one character. I think I should have written it's a sin, queer as folk, cucumber. That's the chronological order. And I think Richie would become Stuart, would become Henry. Actually, I think there's a very straight line. I think the easy version of that is says Richie would become Vince, but that's an easy option. Richie becoming Stuart, becoming Henry is much more true. I think. Um, and I mean, it's it, it has the the reaction to this has I mean David you must feel it. it's been gobsmacking because mm -hmm. we made we made a lovely good strong drama we were very proud of it and you kind of but it's about eight you kind of expect that to go out and people go well done and you know it, it gets a blue ribbon or something and then put on a shelf and be dragged out at every gay retrospective in 20 years for it to be popular and successful is gobsmacking I don't think any of us are expecting it. not what we, it's the kind of thing you hope for but none of us are expecting it and I'm still reeling about it and Honestly, it's like I'm getting stopped in the street about five or six times. I'm the writer, and I get stopped in the street about five or six times a day. And the other day, I went for a walk, and it was one woman who was 60-odd. She said, I was a nurse. I was at the Royal Free Hospital. I knew those boys. And then the next person, the next woman must have been 70, and she is all straight people, and she, she would be the social worker. I knew those boys. She said the third person was a man with his wife, both in their 70s, and he said, I worked for Public Health England back then, and he said, we'd make it up as we went along. We had nothing. We had no information, nothing. So the reach of this seems to be absolutely extraordinary, and the, it's me memory. people's memories are waking up. I think they haven't talked about this stuff in a long time and um it's it's an honor it's kind of an honor to be part of something that the hiv testing rates have, have gone up fourfold in hiv testing week i mean that's that's extraordinary that's life-changing for some people it's like, so it's a, it's a great honor it's a great honor i think also it's got it's got something really interesting about it because i think um you know it's got a lot of different sides to the story i think it's both got the sad element uh, and the suffering, the, the taboos and all the rest of it, but it also has some a, a, an urgency and a, a lust for life and a kind of real sort of life affirming feel to it, which I, I, I think people really hold on to uh, and memories, of course, for a lot of people. And David, can, I just, can I just ask you, David, how, how you translated that into the filmmaking style, what, what your strategy was? Well, we... we um, to kind of well if you go into the technical side of it i think we we peter and i peter who directed it um and of course russell uh, as much involved as, as as always with a lot of things um we discussed uh we discussed colors and lenses and 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 just the energy in which you you would you'd kind of treat the different scenes with and so you know there, there are certain subtleties that um I you know change of lens depending on which characters we were with in terms of you know the, the more classical families and and the Keeley Hawes family, um, Richie's family, home life amongst others, were treated with um, anamorphic lenses uh, just to give it a bit more soft feel in the, uh, around the edges and then um, and, and maybe a little bit more distance I suppose to the characters uh, to say in, in some respect and then with the younger lot, you know, for the fun and the pink palace. Uh, we had we had different lenses that allowed us to be closer to the characters and, and a bit more reactive to 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 the way they were were acting and and the scenes that that were in the pink palace. What about camera movement? Do you have a strategy for that? Well equally Pink Palace there was there was compared to all the rest, there was definitely a lot more handheld in the Pink Palace. Uh, some scenes it didn't feel quite right, but when we were, were with the young people, it just felt like the camera needed a little bit more energy. Not every single scene, so it became too too much of a statement that this is the style for Pink Palace, but just a little bit more just to give it some energy. Um, and 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 we did try and get get a lot of movement into it, and I think uh, some of it some of the movement came from us, and then other. Parts of the movement came from from Russell, and I think the writing, which you know, is is really daunting at times, where where the man sits at home and he writes something, you know, as crazy as scene, whatever, um, and then there's about fifteen small scenes within the scene, you know, spunk flying through the air, uh, uh, a, a meteorite fall crashing down to earth. Uh, a, a stewardess, uh, whatever, like blowing kiss, and you know, just all these things that just are very easy to write when you're sat very comfortably. And then, of course, you have to translate them into visuals. But I think um, when you're doing them, every single one of them take an hour or two, whatever they take. Um, but then, 
as it's all put together, uh, it gives this incredible pace and energy to it, I think. And then we threw in, Peter had this great idea of, of, of whip pans onto it. And we, we kind of tried to get in and out of those moments uh, as elegantly as we could with, with just to add and emphasize that energy that was on the page. I would say as well, best backdrops, best lit backdrops I've ever seen. Because I was, I just like real locations. I don't like set builds because set builds, everyone's televisions are so sophisticated now. Sets look like sets and you see some even really expensive dramas. You see some appalling sets. And so we tried to get a real location for the Pink Palace and it was just, it was over Christmas. We filmed over Christmas, it was impossible. Every flat was up for rental at Christmas. So we built it and I was literally sitting there going, please don't give me neck curtains. And you know, you see those, you can tell a drama when it's a set, they've got neck curtains. And it, you've done the most fantastic job, David. It's like they're, they're photographic backdrops, but they're lit properly and they're lit from every angle, depending on what you do. you've done. It's absolutely convincing. I just love it. Thank you. I can't thank you enough for that. It sells the whole drama there. We actually, we had these soft, uh, soft drops, they're called, which, which I hadn't used before, but which work for both day and night scenes. Uh, so that made it slightly easier to, to, to use them for night and you have sort of twinkles of windows outside, which, which helped a lot, I think. Yeah, it's great. And it's the space you choose, isn't it? It's the distance between the set yeah. and the backdrop. That had to be on, you know, we had to find a studio, where was that? Was it an old school, that one? It was an old school, yeah. Old school, been, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were, there, there were definitely, it feels like the educational system in Manchester is slowly either being renewed or pulled down. Yes, <laughs> we were all in old school. This year's yeah. schools we actually shot in for hospital corridors or, or whatever it might be. Um, well, I because I think your master, the Pink Palace is obviously pretty, I think your masterpiece is that hospital corridor, because it's, what, 100 yeah. metres long? Yes. It's, and that's Peter Hawley because the script's in a long, long, long corridor and there's a lot, if you see episode five, there's a lot of marching up and down hospital corridors and bless Peter, he absolutely insisted on getting a long, long, long corridor, which was a nightmare because you think, <laughs> you know, everything has to be changed with the 80s, the plugs and yeah. the settings and everything and my God, that's successful. That looks, yeah. those pools of light in the roof, I love it. I love it. I think you've done the most brilliant job on that whole thing. Luana, who designed it, was, I think she was quite daunted to begin with because it was a school with literally, which was dilapidated and, 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 and falling to bits. But they managed to, to completely recreate that, um, that whole hospital world. And, um, I think everyone will think we just shot in a hospital. I don't think anyone yes. will spot that as, as, as a build in any sense. Like, mm. She's a brilliant, great team, great team. It's huge amounts of work going into it for sure. Yeah. But it paid off, I think. And I think it needed that because I think just as, 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 as you're very good at writing, you know, 15 scenes within a scene, then, then um, we also had, I don't know how much we were spoiling it for people if, um, if we have, what have we got to it? Most people have seen it, yeah. I think, yeah. There's, there's a lot in episode five, which takes place in, in a cor corridor, hospital corridor, and um, with a lot of stumping back and forwards within that corridor, which, which I really think, the, as you say, the, the, the distance and the length of the travel is, has become part of the story to some extent. It's amazing how many people think that's one take. So many people have said to me, oh, I love that scene all in one take. It's not. It, it cuts all over the place, but it has the feel. It has that such yeah. a feel of yes. one take. I love it. Yeah. Masterpiece. <laughs> right, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to open up to some questions because we've got loads coming in and I, I don't want to keep you past your half past seven. So we may as well get as many people as we can. And so there's a few different ones. There's lots and lots of comments, but we'll start with... Um, Lots of comments about Queer as Folk and how it was a very important television show for them. Uh, one question has said, Stuart from Queer as Folk is sleeping with someone, someone who's technically underage. How did you deal with writing that and making it? As technically they would have been a paedophile at the time. Um, was there any concern from the studio or the channel? No, they were very open to it because, um, you know, it's like you, you, you don't stop making Agatha Christie's because someone's murdered in it. Mm. Plenty of dramas break the law. It's not about the law. It's mm. about what's really happening on Canal Street and what would really happen between those two men. It's very much, you don't see no judgment like that. And um, there was, it did change when it went to America. It was interesting. They thought it had to be a 17. Of course, when we wrote, he wasn't just a year underage. He was three years underage. Um, the age of consent then was, was 18. Uh, when it went to America, they thought they had to make, um, he wasn't called Nathan then, he was called, uh, I've forgotten his name. Um, ah, what's his name? What's his name, Paolo? What's the young boy? Uh, anyway, um, 
Um, they they made him seventeen, but that's part. You know, it's like it's part. It was part of the challenge of the show. Um, you know, if you're feeling that little shock down in your soul, then um, you know, what kind of dramas do you think we should be watching? Um, and go out into the world. I can now speak out to um, nightclubs um, and, and straight nightclubs and see what's happening out there. That's the, the real story is really happening, and you can't let yourself censor stuff just because there's a law somewhere. Okay, uh, we've got Cucumber's Lance and It's a Sin Colin both tragically lose their lives as a result of meeting men who insist on hiding their sexualities and take out their frustration on otherwise out queer characters. Was gay panic something that you felt was an essential societal issue to portray on screen in your shows? Well, the Daniel story in Cucumber is entirely gay panic because he is a gay man actually in, in denial of his sexuality. So. Um, not gay panic as such, gay panic doesn't exist. Uh, gay panic is not allowed. I mean, that, that comes up in Cucumber episode eight, I think, that actually you can't say that anymore. You can't say that with any justification. It does not exist. It's not a legal defense anymore. Legal teams will still try to use gay panic and um, fought well in some terrible courtrooms. I'm sure it's still used. You're not, I think officially, you're not allowed to say that it doesn't exist. Um, I think that's kind of a misreading of the Colin situation. I mean, yeah, I'm sure old Ross has his frustrations, but um, that is very clearly and at length set up to be consensual. Colin is arranging, after the first night, Colin's arranging those nights. You literally have two scenes in which you see him do that. And he says yes during the sex scene. So um, while Ross's story is very sad, um, I don't think, um, and Colin happens to be the victim of it, but that doesn't make Ross isn't to blame for carrying a virus. Uh, you start, once you start to get into blaming, you get into an awful lot of trouble here. And you start to get judgmental again. Look at people lining up to get judged, these people. Um, it's like, just relax, just, 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 just look at what they do and understand why they're what they do and have a bit of forgiveness. Okay. Uh, question for Paolo. What was the challenge of editing Banana knowing certain plot points would need to intertwine with Cucumber, which may have had a different editor? Yeah, I mean, it's always up to, I, I don't think if it's changed, uh, you know, I think they were so, uh, they, were cons they were already kind of thought through so well that I don't think, it, what, there wasn't really a challenge, I don't think, but to, to going between the two shows. I don't know, I don't think so. They were, it, it just, as I said, it just felt like, an, uh, it felt good to understand the world, universe of both of them and play around with how different they were, but I don't think it was challenging in that sense. They weren't kind of, uh, you know, like the plot mechanics. It wasn't really interested in that. You know, the shows were like, you know, the, the, that's not the game, the game that we were playing, I don't think. You know, it was more kind of like, oh, isn't that cool that that happened? Do you know, you know, it was more playful than that. So I don't think it was kind of super challenging. And that's what I mean by campus in a way. It was kind of collegiate. It's all those cutting rooms were next to each other. Yeah. Just all in, 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 in. In, in Media City, everyone in right. a row, so there were no secrets. Everyone was looking at each other's material all the time, which is great. Yeah. It was like the NFTS then. <laughs> yeah, there we are. All right. <laughs> um, okay, we've got a question uh, for everyone. Is there a person you'd like to work with or a theme you'd like to explore in your work that you haven't yet had the chance to? Uh, should we start with Charles? Either well, person... at the very beginning, I'm just looking for the fresh ideas, fresh themes, fresh scripts, and it's a voice that you haven't heard before. So when I get a script, I know on the first page if it's something that I want to do. I know whether I'm going to believe it. I'm in a situation at the moment of being asked to do something which is high profile thing, but I don't believe it. And so I'm not going to do it because I can't <laughs> fake that, you know, you know, I, you know, I'm not a good enough actor to fake it. So I just wait for the things that chime with me. There's something in them that connects with me. And then, you know, I can be precise about queer as folk. It's just about those relationships of friendship and love and unrequited love and all that stuff that connects. And, and that's what good drama is. You just see themes that are human and you, you want to tell those stories. So it's on a case by case basis. Whenever I get a script, I know immediately whether it's something that I'll try with. Okay. David, is there a person you'd like to work with or a theme that you'd like to explore in a, something you're about to photograph in the future? No, I think it's a bit like the Charles really that that you know you get sent a script and and you read it and, and you feel where you've got a connection with it um, and I don't know that uh, there's anything I, I like human stories and I, I like to tell stories about people and love and sadness and all the rest of it um, having said that I have also done other things and enjoyed it for other reasons so I think it's it's really finding that 
thing that interests you in, in a project, whether it's uh, sci-fi or period dramas or, or whatever it might be. But I think it always comes back to, and I think it is the good story really, and, and the characters behind the, 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 that you first graph, that they somehow shine through that, that, that bit of cellulite, which is no longer cellulite, but kind of um, appears on screen um, that, I'm, that I'm eager to capture. But, but you know, things, stories like It's a Sin, I thought, um, to me, you know, that's a, a dream uh, come true in the sense that it's an important story and it's, uh, you know, they're, they're all great characters and um, you kind of, you want to work with nice people. I think that's my, my key thing, really. <laughs> that's, that when I talked to, to, to Phil, the producer, and, and Peter, uh, and then subsequently Russell, that they're all people you click with and, and want to spend time with, and that's really the most important part. Paolo, same question for you. I, I agree with, with everything that's been said. I think for me, it's really interesting as an editor to kind of go and do different styles of things as well. And I think I've, I've been kind of able to do, you know, we were joking with Russell before, uh, just going from the crown and then well going from cucumber to the crown and then for Dracula with uh, <laughs> Stephen Moffat and you know and then now I'm doing a horror and I love I love that it it's a it's a playing around with different styles and different genres I think it's, it's something that really interests me but I don't know that there's a, a specific person that I can say you know or, or a specific theme certainly not it's whatever the, the, that particular story kind of you know speaks to me but yeah, but definitely the, this idea of going back and working with people that you, that you get along with and people that you collaborate creatively well with, it's fantastic. I mean, I've been trying to, we've been trying to kind of work together for years and it's just, you know, me and Russell and it hasn't happened yet again since, since Cucumber and Banana. But I've had people that I always work with, you know, directors that I always collaborate with and it's a fantastic uh, experience. I always really enjoy that. Um, well, we'll make it, Russell. We'll, we'll eventually, we'll get there. <laughs> and Russell, last but not least, question for you. Uh, I think Viola Davis. Oh, Can't yeah. take my eyes off her. Can't take my eyes, just everything. Well, actually, this kind of goes into this next question. Russell's work always seems to attract incredible rising stars, e.g. Lydia West was superb in years and years and returned in It's a Sin with an even more fantastic performance. But is there any actor you'd love to have cast in your work and you haven't yet had the chance to work with? There we go, Viola Davis. But it's always, I bet you'll share this, all of you. It's always that new actor, isn't it? It's always the next one. Um, um, and that's a, a member to where I work with a casting director called Andy Pryor and his staff, Ree and Ray. And they're just brilliant. They've cast every single Doctor Who of the, of the new Doctor Who's. They've cast everything I've done since 2005. And, um, and they're great people, and and and, and um, they are just all good casting directors are just permanently on the search for new people. And so when Lydia walks in, I mean, there's, there's people in it's a sin who've never been on screen before. Omari, who plays Roscoe, hasn't done television before. Uh, Callum, who plays Colin, was still at college at Welsh College, so he'd come and spend a week with us. And he go back to college, he go back to classes, ordinary classes, and he's he's come out of this as with phenomenal acclaim. What an actor! It's and amazing. And he's just brilliant, isn't he? Nathaniel Curtis, who plays Ash. That that's the greatest joy. That the brand new ones, the people who just know you'll be watching on screen in fifty years' time. I mean, that's really something. That's great. Okay, let's go with. Um... Russell, what is your approach, what is your process when approaching death in your scripts and killing off characters? <laughs> you have a gift for choosing the most heartbreaking ones. <laughs> yes, I suppose, I, I do have a process actually, which is to make it, which is, there's a lot of deaths on television. Uh, every night there's a death on television. And, and I think it's the biggest thing in the world that can happen. It's the last thing that can happen. I never like it when it's skipped over. I remember when I was a young lad working on soap operas and there was a bishop pushed his, pushed his mistress down the stairs, like it broke her neck. And his the bishop's wife had to go back into the house to get some evidence that her husband had been there. And I remember one of those storyline meetings on soap operas where everyone's sitting around the table and... Um, and you know, we discussed the bishop's wife going into the house where there was a dead body lying at the bottom of the stairs. And someone said, oh, she just steps over it, doesn't she? She just, it's a dead body, she just steps over it. And uh, it was a, one of the key moments of my life. I just sitting there going, that's a dead body. You can't do that. You can't, that's really a dead person. 
you can't do that. That's huge. That's a vast drama. Is it funny? I remember that after all these years. And that was one of those moments of me like going, actually, rather than cop shows or whatever, where people just die, die, die all over the place. I take them. I think I had good deaths because I make them really real, really real. They have consequences. There's a build up to it. I don't look away. Um, I don't dwell on it either because I think the screen can get very fetishistic about death sometimes and you know I never want to long, linger on a dead body um so yeah it's to treat it it's to treat it as a big event as big an event in drama as it is in life that's absolutely my approach yeah cool uh question for david cass nelson david what was your favorite scene to shoot and why i'm guessing we're talking about it's a sim specifically yes what was the scene um that's quite, it's actually very hard to pinpoint a particular scene, I think, because they, it's so much fit into these different characters. Each character had some key scenes that were, were actually absolutely great to film, uh, you know, a lot of, of emotional stuff. But one day, which was particularly fun, particularly fun um, was, was actually um, this shooting the Heaven nightclub scene was, was great fun with Ollie. Um, Richie coming into this nightclub and sort of swinging around and, and kissing boy after boy and while he gives this incredibly long monologue and um, and that was a that was definitely a fun day and it's always a kind of it's a thing which is unthinkable of at the moment having a, a nightclub full of however many people 100 people who were just dancing closely and kissing and all the rest of it and, and this sort of steady cam swoops around the whole place and that that kind of thing is is fun as a cinematographer, I suppose. Uh, but equally, uh, it, it was fun to film Richie um, playing one of his, or doing a little bit of acting on one of the Doctor Who sets um, and having to, to recreate a bit of 80s lighting and, and just sort of do things in a different way. And we shot it with these uh, real cameras that, that BBC used to have, tube cameras. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, um, and that was a, a new experience having, I, I, those are the cameras, kind of cameras I started out with, uh, coming back to them and seeing the incredibly narrow latitude they had and filming with these enormous cameras and pedestals with old lights and everything was, was fun. There's something wrong with your skin, right? <laughs> That's yeah, 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 yeah. One. Which actually to me was, was, was such a strong moment and such a turning point, obviously, in the sense that this is when Richie finds out that he's he's yeah. well. Uh, That's a real story. That really happened to a friend of mine who was really? an actor. He and I remember we talked about that. Anything odd in that show is real. He was really on set. He was HIV positive. The DOP took ages lighting him, and eventually, in the middle of the set, said to him, "There's something wrong with your skin," and he knew his HIV had become AIDS. He just knew it, and the whole day carried on, carried on working, and he went home that night and went for the test. That's true. It's absolutely true. That astonishing. I mean, it's incredible. It's an incredible yeah. story. The DOP said there's something wrong with your skin. Yeah. Uh, okay, we've got a question for Charles. Charles, do you remember what was your first big break into the industry? And have you ever felt that you wanted to do writing yourself and write your own material? I um, made a student film at the NFTS, which was about football hooligans based on uh, a play that I'd seen written by a, a script writing student at the school. I'd seen it at the Albany Empire, I asked him to adapt it and we adapted it. Uh, when we took it, we, we filmed in Spain about English football hooligans going to fight Spaniards because of the Falklands War happening at the same time in the World Cup. And when we, when we got sponsorship from the ferry company, uh, we said it was a romantic comedy, but on the ship, when we were filming scenes on the ship, we were um, obviously, big bruising hooligans wearing Union Jacks who didn't look very romantic. So we learned to lie at an early stage because we had to film all these scenes surreptitiously. Uh, and that film went through, for some reason it got into the tabloids on the day that it went onto the BBC, I think in uh, 1990. And um, so it was a great calling card for the people who worked on the film. Um, so I suppose that would be a, you know, a, a break that we had quite early on the writer and I. Um, what was the second part? The, the second part was whether you've ever written your own material or ever wanted to write your own. Yeah, I have done, with usually with other writers, and, and that writer in particular, Nick Perry, who was from the National Film School. Um, we've co-written stuff and uh, I've done it subsequently throughout my career. But I really love getting scripts 
and just getting a, an envelope with it, you know, particularly when they were physical scripts, it made a difference to me that it was actually pieces of paper. Getting a script, sitting down, choosing the place you're going to read it for the first time, that first reading is so important. And you know, as I said on the first page, firstly, can this person write? You know that immediately on the first page. And secondly, very quickly after that, whether it's something you want to read. And then it's, a, it's an incredibly important hour or two hours that it takes you to read that. And I, I want to read it slowly at the speed that I'm going to see it. So I'm not, I'm not doing this, but I, it's, it's, to me, it's something that I, I wait for the right time of day to read it. I go to the right place to read it, like a bit of background noise or, you know, for different people, it's different things. But you take that time seriously to read something, knowing that it could be very important for your immediate future. And I treat it, you know, treat it very seriously. Okay. Uh, let's see what we've got. Uh, let's go with this one. Uh, Rustin, we've spoken about all your successes. But what was your biggest risk? Did it fail? And what did you learn from the fails that didn't work? Biggest risk? Mm, um, bah, 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 everything's a risk. Um, the biggest risk, to be honest, the biggest risk was Doctor Who. That's like people were lining up to tell me that wouldn't work. Nicholas Schindler included. When I went off to do that, I remember Nicholas Schindler said to me, you can love it all you like, it'll never love you back. <laughs> like the voice of doom. And uh, it's hard to genuinely, I mean, this isn't a particular tale of artistic suffering, but but it was. It was like there was an awful lot of resting on that. We spent an awful lot of money. So we could make 13 episodes and you know, sit down the heart of BBC Prime Time. And you kind of knew that, you know, for me as a Doctor Who fan, that if we got that wrong, they would have knackered the franchise just completely. There would be no second chances after that, or third chances, um, that it would be dead. So so um, yeah, that was a very big risk. It's you know, the program had been reduced to a joke and 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 a, a comedian's punchline, and and everyone was saying, "Oh, the Harry Potter now." Kids watch Harry Potter. Kids watch Star Wars. They're never going to know that. People were lining up to tell me it wouldn't work, but I knew it would. I absolutely, I knew it could. I didn't know it would, but I knew it could. So um, yeah, that was that was risky. Okay. Uh, another question for you, which character in your writing career most resembles you? Oh, none of them and all of them, really. It's it's hard, that question. It's like, um, um, it's funny, people always look at queer as well and go, oh, you're so much like Vince, because Vince is the really easy option because he's nice and sweet and compromising. And actually, I'm much more Stuart-like. It's like, it's like it's, you, you don't get ahead in this industry without being a bit Stuart-like at times. <laughs> um, and um, But it's all of them. It's the women, it's everyone. It's like, they're all bits of me and they're all bits of everyone I've heard. So um, I don't ever, it's not, I don't ever sit here thinking, oh, this is me. They'll all express a bit of you at some point, but um, we're all many people. You're a different person if you're talking online like this, if you're talking to your lover, if you're talking to your gran, if you're talking to a baby, if you're talking to your mum. It's like we are all many, many voices, so they all get used. So all of them is the answer to that, really. Uh, it's a question for all of you, but it'll be interesting to hear the different points of view from a writing director and the editor DP. But how stressful do you feel when leading up to the release or waiting for viewing figures of your latest piece of work? Uh, should we start with Charles and Russell, who I think are probably going to be a lot more worried than the editor and DP? <laughs> Go ahead, Russell. Well, uh terrified that's what it's all about frankly i know it shouldn't be but yes you just want the viewing figures and um that's what it's i'm glad it's harder now it's more scattered now and it's all um streaming figures and stuff like that but you make these things to be seen absolutely absolutely it's, it's horrible it's a horrible process <laughs> charles the same i've never thought of it as horrible i just wanted to do the job as well as could be done in that period of time and then it's not your responsibility thereafter you know there's a lot of other things that get in the way in terms of promotion and things and what is up against all that stuff but um you have to make something good you know and that's that is my job make it as make it as good as it should be or make it as good as you can make it with those sets of conditions and uh you know that's why you choose the good writing that's the most important decision is choosing good scripts and Paolo and David, I guess in many cases, the editor and DP have moved on to the next project by the time that... Yeah, I, I mean, we are always kind of on, on to the next thing, but, but and obviously it's, I don't, I'm not really concerned about viewing figures. It's not something that I always get attached to, but I am, I am really always paying attention to how people receive it in general. And that really, really feels personal, if, especially if it's something that I'm really, 
attached to or, or proud of, you know, it's it, it's it's sad to see something like Cucumber not become as popular as it sh we thought it could have been, it should have been. But the response of the people that did watch it, so as I said, till this day is so touching that for me, that's the thing that I remember the most, you know, that's the, it's like, it's people saying, oh, it moved me. It's one of the best pieces of television that I've ever seen. You know, you, you can hear that stuff and it's, it's that's the, the stuff that you remember. But obviously I'm not, no, it, there's not a lot at stake for me if something is super watched or not watched. It's different for those guys, you know, if you're the writer of the show, the director of the show, it's different. It's a lot safer as the editor. But you love the shows that you really love. You pay attention and you want people to watch it. You want people to, because you believe in it, you know. Yeah. David, the same or? Well, yes, it doesn't it directly influence, you know, my, my further career, whether, whether, you know, five people or 10 million people watch something. But at the same time, of course, you want your, what you shoot to be seen by people. That's why, why, why part of why, why you do it. I have to say, I loved the night that It's a Sin came out and it was all being streamed and just lying there in bed, having watched the first episode and then going on to the next and just following the, the Twitter feeds and whatever else and just the impact it had on, on, on people and, and how, how much it meant to a lot of people, I think, to watch it and them sharing their stories and so on. I think that was really sort of uh, the most heartfelt um, experience I've had in terms of, of actually keeping up with something I've done um, and just enjoying that moment, I suppose, that, that you produce something that actually in this really sort of horrible time with a pandemic actually means something to people and, and moves people and, and, um, and make them feel better or comfort them in some ways or both enjoyment and, and the other way. Okay, we've got, <laughs> we've got 52 questions, but we're going to pick three and quickly come to an end, unfortunately, because we're almost out of time. Uh, there's lots around this subject, but it's to Russell, which is what advice do you have for aspiring writers who are looking for that first break? Oh, gosh. I mean, if I had a magic answer to that, it's, well, first of all, um, write your scripts. And, and I mean that. It's like start it and then finish it. That's the hard bit. And a lot of people haven't done that. It's like, just get on with it. Always remember your enemies and your competitors are ahead of you. It is a competition. I love saying that. <laughs> it's a competition. It's a fight. Don't sit there waiting for that chance because everyone else is getting ahead of you. And um, and then um, and be professional. Seriously, pay pay attention to the length. If it's if, not, if it's an hour long for television, don't deliver a script that's a hundred pages. Don't be so stupid. It's amazing how people do that. It's like you know that people always say, "Don't put, you know, check it for typos, check it for spacing." Do really do that because you're handing scripts over to people who read scripts all day long if they get a script that's full of typos and it's all slapdash they feel insulted i can't tell you how many people ignore that oh it doesn't matter it's creative oh I'll just splash it all down don't be so stupid do the job and do it professionally the hard thing is getting to send it to people and um um so you've just got to work harder that. there's no magic solution to that there are some companies that uh, read scripts unsolicited. There is uh, the BBC Writers Room, which is a great resource. Um, and but basically, start the script and finish it, and make sure it looks good. That is not a small point. It looking good. It's really like Charles said. Charles sits there, he finds the right place to open and read it. If the script looks a mess, you put it off right from the start. Don't do that. Okay. Uh, uh... Russell, I know you're a big fan of Corrie and have a history with the show. If you were offered showrunner, would you take it? Oh, not in a million years. Jesus Christ almighty. And <laughs> six episodes a week. Can you believe it? I would cut it down to three. I would love to week. watch that show. It would be good, I see. It would be good. I would instantly cut the number of episodes down to three a week. The six a week is killing. It's dead. And the, the view can just go down. You know, they're on a long decline and major work is needed on those shows someone somewhere on some channel's got to take a deep breath and say we need to protect these for the next 20 years because they're not doing that now anyway don't i could i could do three hours on that don't worry <laughs> uh okay and the last question which is for each of you what's next let's start with russell i i'm having i'm the script editor now lenny henry wrote to me out of the blue Will you mentor me on my scripts? I was like, all right then, Lenny. Lovely. And um, and lo and behold, it's, it's script's been commissioned. It's called Three Little Birds, Try TV. 
Um, and that's, I'm going to be, I'm kind of like, I'm the script editor on it. And he's lovely to work with. And what a laugh. So it's kind of like, I'm not calling that an easier year, because I'm sure it'll, it'll throw up its, its problems, but really nice to help get something made. Yeah. Uh, Paolo? I'm uh, uh, editing a film called The Origin, uh, The Moment, uh, directed by Andrew Cumming, just by Oliver Kessman, who did uh, some mod um, before that. So I'm cutting that now. And then I'm going back to season five of The Crown starting in July. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's next. Well, fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> David? Yeah, yeah. I'll see what. Not sure. Yeah, I'm reading scripts uh, and going to meetings at the moment. So we'll see. And Charles, you're off to Boston, aren't you? Yeah, I did a show pilot um, at the end of last year, which got picked up by HBO. So we're going back into production on that as soon as it's safe to do so. At the same time, I'm turning down scripts that I don't believe in. <laughs> oh, it's great. Not pretty much. <laughs> okay, that that is the end of our very first uh, our very first NFTS backstories. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, in two weeks' time, we'll have our next one, which is going to be hopefully with Terence Davis talking about his career and his work. Uh, there's lots of messages of thanks from all of the uh, viewers. So thank you very much to our panelists and thank you again and have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you, folks. Okay, everyone. Thank you. Good to see you. Lovely to see you guys. I know. Bye. -bye. I knew. Bye-bye. Good luck, everyone. Bye-bye.